What's going on, everyone? This is the Fantasy Playbook Podcast. My name is Kyle Yates, and I am your host. I can be found on Twitter at KyleYNFL. I am joined today by the one, the only Mike Clay of ESPN. He can be found on Twitter at Mike Clay NFL. Mike, how are you today? It is good to see you, my friend. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good, although for the people watching on video right now, I'm kind of embarrassed because you have this like super HD quality, beautiful background. Everything looks great, and I don't know what's going on with my in my basement here the lights are like the sun is basically in my basement blaring on me but uh i have my cool eye racing rig behind me though so I, hopefully that offsets the the terrible visualizations otherwise <laughs> hey this is what uh this is what we look working from home looks like sometimes you don't have the awesome the sports center you know everything behind you sometimes <laughs> yeah. you know you gotta you gotta make do so it's it is what it is i'm glad that you're here though looking into some projections here today this is an awesome conversation one that i'm really really looking forward to because one of my favorite things to do going into the nfl season is to talk with other analysts and to kind of get a gauge on that do projections. All right. Where did you kind of land with this player? Because after doing, you know, projections for the LA Rams, Allen Robinson came out way higher in my projections than I anticipated that he would kind of gauging with other people and seeing, did the same thing happen for you? This is going to be an awesome conversation as we tick through several players that were really, really tough for me to project and kind of getting your thoughts here too. So before we get into that though, I want to remind everyone about the giveaway going on here, courtesy of fan tracks. That is a signed DK Metcalf, Seattle Seahawks Jersey, Go over to the ffplaybook.com slash fan tracks giveaway for all the details on how to enter. You have through the month of July to get entered into this giveaway. So the ffplaybook.com slash fan tracks giveaway, F A N T R A X giveaway. Make sure to go over and do that. Additionally, like I mentioned, we're going to talk a ton about projections. If you want to get into doing projections, you want to dip your toes into the water here and start to get acclimated into what this process looks like. I have the premium projection template available for purchase over at the ffplaybook.com slash shop. $20 gets you access into this. It brings team by team, walks you through where you can do projections for every single player, do target share, rushing share, break it all down there for you. $20, 10% of every template purchased goes directly to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So the ffplaybook.com slash shop brings in all the historical stat data for you, makes it super easy to go team by team and do your own projections. Mike, let's kick off this conversation here. And before we get into looking at specific players, I wanted to ask you, what is kind of your thought process and how you approach projections, right? What is the what is the benefit of it? Why should people really start to consider doing this more if they have not done so already? Yeah, so the uh, the process, as you know, someone who does projections is tough. I mean, I basically care uh, or maybe uh, tough. Certainly, we know that prognostication for football is obviously very hard. There's so many variables, but uh, it takes a lot of work, right? You have to really be dedicated to it. I can't tell you how many people I've said were interested in, uh, you know, this this kind of level of projection and they get started and it just, you know, it slips or they stop doing it because it is a lot. I mean, I basically keep mine uh, up and up and running and updated about 11 months of the year. The only time I really right. don't is after the playoffs when I'm kind of building for next year, updating working through league trends, player trends, adjusting for coaches, whatever it may be, getting depth charts ready, pulling free agents off. You know, that's a time where I kind of uh, basically, you know, have downtime like an app would for, uh, you know, or a a website would for upgrades. So, um, you know, it's just a a constant, constant process. Uh, I think the value of them uh, is kind of obvious. I mean, you're just kind of trying to put the puzzle together, right? So I think a, a good example of why you wouldn't just, straight up rank guys and kind of ignore the projection process is a team like the saints right i tweeted something about this when they signed jarvis landry which is if you were to go player by player through their pass catcher say alvin Kamara, about a 20 percent target share michael thomas when he's when he's healthy say 24 25 percent conservatively uh chris olave generally a top 15 or so rookie is going to be in the you know 18 to 20 percent range at least that's what we've seen the past you know five ten years Jarvis Landry, generally heavily targeted when he's out there, right? He's going to be in that 20% range, if not higher. The occasional target here or there for Marcus Calloway and Traquan Smith and Deontay Hardy, you know, they're going to mix them in here or there. You can't just completely ignore guys like right. that. Same thing for like a Mark Ingram uh, or the fullback or, you know, Taysom Hill, the occasional play for him, Adam Troutman, Nick Finette, the tight ends are going to get a 15, 20% target share. So you add up all the numbers I just said, and what are we at? 120, 130%, right, right? right? So you look at something like that and you're like, you know what? Maybe there's not enough volume to go around for these guys. I need to kind of bring 
uh, down the targets a little bit and kind of see that whole picture for that offense and say, okay, well, maybe I'm a little high on Jarvis Landry because he doesn't have the path to targets he, he might have otherwise. So uh, that's you do that for all 32 teams and you're going to kind of see a picture and then you could kind of make adjustments from there. Uh, I think it's it's really huge to kind of find a little edge, right? We're always looking for little edges. Right. This is the way you can do that. I think it's a really, really cool way to get the most realistic outcome, right? And to kind of get a sense of what you're, you know, you could go into the year and you can say, okay, I really, really like this player. Like you mentioned, okay, Jarvis Landry, you know, he signs in New Orleans. Oh man, I really like Jarvis Landry in this landing spot. And then when you go through and do the projections for every single team, you get to the end of it and you're like, okay, he came out way lower than I anticipated in my projections. Maybe I need to adjust my expectations, right? This is a way to kind of just take a logical approach to it. I really, really enjoy the process of projections, but it can be kind of, you know, you can miss. You can kind of go a little bit here or there. So what I want to do here is walk through several players here that I have had a tough time projecting this season and get your thoughts here. So let's kick it off with Kansas City. Let's go not to the wide receiver room, but let's go to the running back room. Let's go with Ronald Jones here. Moving over from Tampa Bay in 2020, we saw him be, you know, a really, really effective running back. And then just kind of in the doghouse for Bruce Arians last year, lost that job to Leonard Fournette. So he now lands in Kansas City, but you've got CEH there. And Clyde edwards helaire has really been inefficient, uh, a guy that has not lived up to expectations over the first couple of years of his career. What are kind of your expectations and projections here for Ronald Jones in Kansas City? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely one of the tougher backfields to project, right? When it comes to pr projections, you can obviously create algorithms or ways to uh, project rate stats, right? So say generic, you know, yards per carry for a running back, but um, you know, the volume aspect takes some interpretation based on beat reports and the history of how guys are utilized and what their role is going to be based on other guys in the backfield. Um, you know, not only Edwards Elaire and Ronald Jones, but also Jarek McKinnon, who was their best running back on a per game basis last season, right? He totally destroyed it in the playoffs, but at the same time, he's, you know, near 30 years old and, you know, we, he had the rare rest days when he was in San Francisco. So you don't expect him to be necessarily a 15 touch uh, guy a game, but maybe a guy that sees six to eight touches and could be a factor here. So uh, it is a, definitely a tough backfield uh, to project. And in situations like that, what I tend to do is kind of hedge a little bit. So I have Edwards Elaire and Ronald Jones, you know, kind of close in, in terms of carries. You know, I, I give Edwards Elaire a slight edge. Uh, McKinnon with a handful of carries and some involvement in the passing game. Uh, I do give Edwards Elaire an, an edge in the passing game just based on what we've seen, you know, in terms yep. of his usage and, and Rojo's struggles in that area. So um, that's kind of, that's how I have it projected. Um, you know, once you get past that point and you lay it out that way, you're getting to the point in the draft where maybe you're, um, you know, fading Edwards Elaire if his ADP gets too high and you're going after Jones if it falls a little bit. You're kind of looking for values based on where they're available in the drafts, but not guys. I, you know, I don't I don't think you can look at this backfield and say, uh, you know, I, there's my RB two, right? I got Rojo. Right. He's my RB two this year, right? You're you're essentially throwing a dart at that point. And that's fine, right? You're in that running back dead zone. If anybody in that dead zone kind of falls a little bit in the draft, that's where you can kind of throw them darts uh, if you're not addressing, you know, wide receiver at that spot. So that's how I'm approaching it, hedging a little bit. And, you know, that's the nature of the, the that's the nature of the business with projection sometimes. Trying to figure out where to play your fantasy football league isn't exactly the easiest decision in the world. You got your group of friends together, whether from college or work or whatever, and you're ready to start getting everything set up but everyone seems to want something different. Some people want the ability to do awesome scoring adjustments and customization, while others don't really mind and just want a simple and easy interface to use and navigate. This is where Fantrax comes in. It offers the incredible customization and ability to adjust unique scoring settings like bonus points for certain positions, but it's also an incredibly sleek and easy interface to navigate. If you're ready to join the platform that everyone in your league is sure to enjoy, sign up for free today at Fantrax.com playbook and be entered to win a signed DK Metcalf Seattle Seahawks jersey. Create your free account and then head over to the FFPlaybook.com slash Fantrax giveaway for all the details on how to enter. That's the FFPlaybook.com slash F-A-N-T-R-A-X giveaway for all the details. Fantrax, the home of fantasy sports. Yeah, I think as I looked at this backfield, and I want your thoughts on this, I looked at Ronald Jones as a guy who has struggled in the past as a receiver, right? Uh, and But we look at CEH as a guy who's an excellent receiver out of the backfield. So I'm trying to piece together, again, projections, trying to piece together the puzzle here. I think Ronald Jones could be this guy that's the, utilized on first and second down, uh, being mm -hmm. that highly effective runner on first and second down and then comes off the field for CEH. So I do have uh, Ronald Jones with a 45% carry share here, CEH with a 35%. 
Uh, and then, of course, just a, a handful with, you know, Patrick Mahomes and Jared McKinnon, maybe Derek Gore, right? All these guys kind of there, but pretty close there. And then CEH getting the, the major edge in the receiving department. So, yes, it does. In projection, CEH for me, slightly ahead of Ronald Jones. But if we do see Jones become that guy on the goal line, could be a situation where Jones drastically outperforms his ADP. And right now, Jones is going outside the top 120 in ADP. He's a guy that I think is worthy of taking a shot later on because he could become that guy on first and second down if we're trying to piece together the puzzle there. Uh, let's move on here to a different backfield. Let's go to Chicago. And this is a really interesting one here where we look at Luke Getze coming over from Ge Green Bay last year as the offensive coordinator. And we know what Green Bay did last year, right? They utilized A.J. Dillon. They utilized Darren Jones both heavily as parts of the offense here, David Montgomery historically has been the guy who has seen a massive workload here in Chicago. But you got Khalil Herbert, who emerged last year as a very, very viable and talented runner, despite being a sixth round draft pick. So what do you see this backfield breaking down as from a projection standpoint? Do you see David Montgomery being that 80 percent guy or do we see more of a kind of near even split here? Yeah, so I know Herbert, you know, he was effective as a rookie, but, you know, we saw down the stretch last season that they went right back to Montgomery. They trust him. He's the guy. And that's been the trend the past couple of seasons. I don't think a sixth round pick is necessarily going to change that. Right. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll they'll switch up the philosophy here with the new coaching, as you mentioned. But I mean, Montgomery has been effective. He's He's been a good back. I know that, you know, that doesn't always show up in yards per carry, but he is a uh, a pretty good football player who can handle that large workload. And I think they're committed to that. I mean, you look at last season, he missed four games. He was still seventh in snaps, ninth in carries, 16th in receptions among running backs, right? When he was out there, uh, he handled a pretty big role. Um, and also, you know, I like him from the perspective that uh, he's been used a lot at the goal line, right? I mean, he's fifth in the league with 36 carries inside the five since he was drafted. Uh, I think kind of quietly, he's been top 15 in, in points per game in fantasy each of the last two seasons. Still in his prime, you know, 25 years old. It's not like we're talking about a 28-year-old who's probably going to play a reduced role. Right. Um, you know, I, I just think you're going to see probably Herbert with similar touches to last season. You know, I think he'll end up with similar numbers. It's kind of how I've been projected, uh, assuming Montgomery holds up for most of the season. So I, I'm still leaning towards Montgomery. And He's looking like a little bit of a value in drafts, I think, right now. I've seen him fall to me a few times. Yeah, I think David Montgomery, the clear guy for me. It's not a near 50-50 split by any means in my projections. I've got David Montgomery with 262 rush attempts, Khalil Herbert with 119. So I do think that we're still going to see Khalil Herbert heavily involved here in this offense, but not to the point where it's going to dramatically hurt David Montgomery's overall volume. I think we could see Chicago try to lean more on that run game. And this is something, too, I want to ask you before we move off to Chicago. How do you bake into the new scheme changes, right? With the new coaching staff and projections, how do you kind of take that information and try to piece it together as far as what this offense could look like moving from one coaching staff to the next? Oh, yeah, I always do that. I spend plenty of time on that in the offseason working through guys who have, uh, you know, a bit of a resume in terms of play calling. Uh, unfortunately, with a team like Chicago, we don't know. You know, Matt Everfluce right. is defensive minded. He's the head coach. And Luke Getze does not have a has not called a, a game, has not called the plays uh, in a game before. So we can't really look at that data. We could just look at kind of their coaching tree. And that's not always super useful. Uh, a lot of times like this, I'll basically look at the personnel. Right. Uh, and right. kind of use that as a driver, maybe conservative in terms of certain play calling things. And then beat reports we're going to rely on. Right. To see, uh, right. you know, what they're hearing and what the trends may be. But again, uh, you know, this is an off a team, Chicago specifically, that we don't expect to be very good this season, barring a big leap from Justin Fields, which is possible, right? I mean, if that mm -hmm. guy's the next NFL superstar, uh, he's gonna he's gonna bring up all of these guys, right? He's gonna make them right. all look good. And that's a possibility. That really is, especially after his his final uh three or four games as a starter last season, which were very impressive against some good defenses. So um you know, again, all in all, pretty conservative in terms of expectations for scheme you know, uh, other than the common sense of you're probably going to run a lot because you have a, a quarterback that could scramble and run, you know, that's going to lean you that way. But at the same time, probably trailing in the second half a lot of, for a team that's going to struggle. So those are all kind of things I'm thinking about. Other teams, we have better play calling and better scheme information. And obviously I'll apply, apply that where, uh, where it's appropriate. Right. All right, let's move on here to the New York Giants. And one of the players that is the most heavily talked about running backs in all of fantasy football this year, because people just simply do not know what the heck to do with Saquon Barkley. Uh, <laughs> it's really difficult from a projection standpoint because you got to kind of assume health. 
uh, with these guys as you're trying to piece together the puzzles of, you know, and rank all these guys. Uh, but then in rankings, you take into account the the injury risk and everything like that. So expectations here and how Saquon Barkley kind of fell in your projections this year with the new scheme. Again, a new scheme here with Brian Dable. Yeah, next topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I was optimistic about Saquon last year and uh, it did not go well. You know, um, even in our uh, I think it was our fantasy football marathon draft on, on ESPN we did last year in August, uh, we got in a little little argument, Stefania, Matthew, uh, I think Anita, myself, you know, and I, cause I drafted Barkley. Right. And I was talking him up and they were like, Hey, he's, you know, he, this and that. And they were right. I was wrong. I mean, I felt like I was right for about a month or so there. He had back to back <laughs> right. top 10 fantasy weeks and he was getting a huge volume immediately playing like 80 plus percent of the snaps. Everything was great. And then he had that ankle injury, that freak an ankle injury where he just stepped on someone's foot when he wasn't looking yeah. and that kind of, ruined the season the Jets offense fell apart so uh really disappointed last year hurt me in in fantasy for sure uh but again you know new offense here with Brian Dable and you know he obviously helped uh maximize that that Bills offense which which switched from very run heavy to very pass heavy uh, helped with Josh Allen's development and you know not notice a team that uh used the running backs a ton but Devin Singletary was very effective and he was certainly fantasy relevant in the second half last season so he found ways when he had a feature back to get them uh, uh enough volume to be fantasy relevant and obviously Saquon Barkley we would expect to, to be a better talent more efficient more effective so only 25 uh you know I think the the best thing going for him probably is that they were not concerned at all with finding you know a, a legit threat in terms of touches in the offseason right Matt Breida who was right. barely hanging on to a roster spot the last couple of years is the number two there. So, um, you know, I, I think there's definitely a chance for a bounce back here, but also I'm hesitant based on the injuries, based on the, the drop and play based on the, the giants offensive line uh, concern. So, uh, you know, I'm not as high as I was last year. Other people have been drafting him before me, but could he jump back into that RB one conversation? Uh, absolutely. But you're right. Definitely a tough guy to project. One of the biggest wild cards going into 2022. We just have, he could be a top five running back again. He could continue to perform outside the top 24 like he did at points last year. Mm -hmm. So very, very difficult player to project. Let's hit the last running back here before we move on to some wide receivers. Cam Akers, the Los Angeles Rams running back here. M miraculous recovery uh, coming back in the playoffs from that Achilles injury. However, he came back here and did not look good, right? He looked like he was coming off of an injury way too soon. Very, very inefficient despite the fact that the Rams just continue to feed him, right? They gave him the volume in the playoffs there. So what are we kind of expecting here from Cam Akers this year with the drafting of Kyron Williams, Daryl Henderson also in this mm -hmm. backfield? Could we expect to see a little bit of work taken off of Cam Akers' shoulders there? Or is it really something where he's fully healthy now? We expect him to get that massive workload. Yeah, I think he'll get the massive workload. I mean, if he got it in the playoffs off the Achilles, I don't see why he wouldn't get it this year, right? I mean, it's not like Daryl Henderson's been a reliable player. Uh, he's been fine in terms of effectiveness, but I think Sean McVay is kind of attached to the, at the hip with Cam Akers and in terms of wanting him to be, I don't want to say their next Todd Gurley, but their next feature back. And, you know, look, he's only played a substantial role in 10 games so far, and he's averaging 19.9 carries and 2.4 targets per game Nuts. in those games, right? So we actually, actually haven't seen a lot of him, but when he has been used and healthy uh, the whole way, he has seen a ton of work. Um, my only concern from a fantasy standpoint, again, is the 2.4 targets per game. That's not a big number. It's not a terrible number. It's not Derrick Henry-esque, but it's uh, it's low. Could limit him from getting into, say, again, the Todd Gurley territory or into the top five. They do have some other guys they could uh, utilize in the passing game, like Daryl Henderson. And also, you know, they're going to utilize the the wide receivers we saw and Tyler Higby as we saw Matthew Stafford do well last season. So um, not to mention, by the way, that when Gurley was there, they ran the ball a lot more. You know, they've kind of moved a little bit toward the pass, especially near the goal line uh, right. with with Matt Stafford. So that could take away some touchdown opportunities. But again, I have him with uh, right around 270 carries, eight rushing touchdowns, another touchdown or two through the air, about 300 uh, receiving yards. This would be enough for fringe RB1 numbers. And if he stays healthy for the most of the season, he'll end up easily in the top 10 with that sort of workload. So optimistic about Akers, but... I also think his ADP is about right, you know, so it's not like right. I'm taking him every draft. I think it's appropriate, but definitely a guy with a high ceiling and probably a higher floor than I think uh, than, than we probably realize. 
All right, let's move on here to the wide receivers. One of the most interesting wide receiver rooms, and I am very interested to hear what your kind of expectations are for this unit, the, the Denver Broncos wide receiver trio. We got Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, but let's talk about Tim Patrick specifically because this is a player that I am absolutely loving where he is going currently in drafts, the ability to get him because I think we're going to see some weeks, this is my expectation, expectation, some weeks where it's a Cortland Sutton week. We have him absolutely with a favorable CB1 matchup and he just goes off. Then there are going to be some weeks where Cortland Sutton draws the Jalen Ramseys of the world, right? The the top tier corners, and we have Tim Patrick with some favorable matchups. So what are your expectations here for Denver, specifically with Tim Patrick? Yeah, it's going to be interesting with, with Sutton because is he their number one? You know, I, we don't know. I mean, if Jerry Judy right. kind of blooms this season, he could easily be the one and draw some of that attention. So I'm not really worried about that, uh, you know, that sort of shadow coverage for Sutton at this point. But, you know, as for Tim Patrick, I mean, here's the thing, the bottom line, right? The guy's 28 years old. He has never been a top 40 fantasy receiver, right? So that's it's tough to say, all right, this guy's a value. He could end up sneaking into the wide receiver three mix. You know, he's never done it, and he's this old. I, again, I know the circumstances have changed, and they have Russell Wilson, but they also have Jerry Judy, and they also have Cortland right. Sutton, and they also have Javante Williams, who they need to utilize a lot. We know they're going to utilize Melvin Gordon after bringing him back a bit, too. So, And, and also, that you know, who's been hyped up probably more than anyone so far this offseason? K.J. Hamler, too coming off the injury, maybe he starts slow, but that's a guy who was a second round pick a couple of years ago uh, and they're going to work him in. So does Patrick boring injuries have a path to consistent startability, we'll say, and in fantasy, I don't think so. I really don't think he does. I think, uh, you know, if all these guys are healthy and out there playing, uh, even if they're playing well, I think he's just going to be, he's just kind of a low ceiling and that's the problem. And that's kind of what we've seen too, right? Even though these guys have missed time and disappeared at times and Patrick side have been a solid receiver for them. You know, his receiving lines are 51, 742 with six touchdowns and 53 for 734 and five touchdowns last year. Almost the same exact line, low, low ceiling, at times a decent floor. Maybe in, maybe in a 16 team league, you feel good about that. But again, a guy at his age, based on his performance, and, you know, all due respect to the guy, maybe underrated as an actual player. I do right. not think he's going to pan out in fantasy. All right, let's move on here to the Baltimore Ravens here as we've got a few players that I want to hit before we get to the end of the podcast. Baltimore Ravens, we saw them uh, throw the ball 611 times last year. Uh, just a ridiculous amount here after throwing 406 times in 2020. So they went from 406 pass attempts to 611 this year. As we expect that number, and I'll guess, I guess I'll pose that as a question. Do we expect that number to come crashing back down and see the rush attempts tick back up here for Baltimore? Where does that leave Rashad Bateman as the guy here? Marquise Brown out of town. We got Bateman as the clear wide receiver one. You got Mark Andrews there who will probably be number one option as far as the, the target share. But what are your expectations here for Bateman? And do we expect to see the overall pass attempts tick down for Baltimore? Yeah, first of all, I do think uh, their movement this offseason has indicated they will go back to a balance, if not run first offense. I think it'll, well, I, let me let me rephrase that. They were kind of balanced last year, maybe a slight lean toward the pass. They're going to go back toward the run this season based on their personnel and the rumblings, the beat reports, that kind of thing. So uh, I do expect that. And that's kind of problematic, right? You look at the years, uh, you know, years before last year. 2019 30th and wide receiver fantasy points The you know, uh, 2020, they were uh, 30th or 30th and 29th. Those two years before that, they were 23rd or lower the prior three seasons. So that's a stretch of five straight years with very low output from the wide receiver position. And, you know, the obvious comeback to that is, well, you know what, you know, Marquise Brown was pretty good and now he's gone and Bateman steps in. But here's the thing. Marquise Brown is the number one receiver for Baltimore. Here's where he's finished in fantasy points. 48th. 45th and then last year a career high 25th right so based on where Bateman's being drafted right now you know he's kind of skyrocketing into that wide receiver two three area you're expecting him to be sealing Marquise Brown and now mm -hmm. and by the way Brown's big season last year came in that balanced offense right. and sometimes had to throw it a lot right so right um I like Bateman as a prospect a lot uh, I have him on a lot of dynasty teams got got him late in the first round last, last year and a lot of uh rookie drafts and uh, he played pretty well had a, a few 80 yard games didn't get to play with Lamar Jackson a lot so could he break out and be a superstar and, and kind of jump into the mix absolutely but I think he's being overdrafted a little bit right now I completely agree with you and that's why I wanted to bring him up because as you look at Mark Andrews there I've got him with a 27 percent target share now I've got them passing 28 times per game so Mark Andrews is going to be fine and then Bateman with a 22 percent target share like that's a pretty substantial mm -hmm. number but then when you take into account that they're only throwing the ball 28 times per game 
that leaves Bateman with 100 target, 105 targets, excuse me, on the season. And so when you're trying to expect Bateman to be this top 24, top 30 wide receiver where he's being drafted currently, you've got to be incredibly efficient. You've got to be outperforming your, you know, expectations with yard, yards per reception, and you've got to be dramatically outperforming expected touchdown rate, right? That's the thing yeah. that Bateman has to do. So those are some pretty high bars to clear. Now, again, he has the talent level to do it, but Bateman was one of the guys, when I got through my entire set of projections, he came out a lot lower than I expected he would mm -hmm. and where he's being drafted. So in redraft this year has nothing to do with the talent level. I absolutely loved him coming out of Minnesota, like you mentioned, but this is a, a situation here where if those pass attempts do not stay around 611 per year, they come crashing down. It's hard to see outside of injury how Mark and or how Rashad Bateman can really return value on where he's being drafted. All right, let's yeah. go to yeah. the L.A. Do you have anything to add there? Oh, yeah. I was, and I was just going to add that, you know, he's not really a big receiver and he only had three end zone targets last season. Right. Had very low usage near the goal line. So that's obviously going to need to change as well. And my target shares. Almost the same, you know, I'm a little lower, 25% for Andrews, 23% for Bateman, but still 23 for a receiver. That's a big number, right? right? And yeah. it's still, he comes in low for us. Yep. All right, let's go to the LA Rams here. I talked about this player at the top. I uh, was really, really shocked to see where Allen Robinson ended up in projections when it was all said and done. What are your expectations here for Robinson coming off of an absolutely just horrific year last year in Chicago? A lot of external factors could have played a role in that. But now with Matthew Stafford, you got Cooper Cup. You've got Allen Robinson as the clear wide receiver too. And then it's Van Jefferson, who's going to be that deep field option. You've got Tyler Higby, Cam Akers out of the backfield. We talked about some of those pieces. It seems like Allen Robinson is in a situation to really, really smash this year. But I want to hear your expectations here. Yeah, and uh, that's that's interesting. It's funny. I, I had the same uh, argument, if you will, with Matthew Berry on our podcast a few weeks ago because he's pretty high on uh, Robinson around, I think he is, has him 26th. And I'm closer to 35th, right? So I'm a little bit lower. Okay. I think our consensus is more in the middle. Uh, and look, I get it. You know, this has been one of the best receivers over the past five years or so in the NFL, top 10 in 2019 and 2020. But you said it. I mean, production fell off last season, even before the injury issue down the stretch, his efficiency was terrible. And it's easy to say, look, that was just, you know, Matt Nagy. It was a Chicago offense. Throw it away. But D Darnell Mooney had no problems. You know, he had, a, sure. he had a fantastic breakout season last year. Tons of volume. I mean, he was effective. He was a playmaker. But Allen Robinson couldn't seem to do it. So, you know, maybe it just didn't didn't work with he and, and Fields or whoever happened to be under center on those given weeks. Uh, I get that. You know, he's obviously going to a much better situation now. But, you know, a couple of things. When he was a top, you know, a top 10 scoring receiver, he was the number one receiver for his team. That's no longer the case here. Right. Um, and the other thing I'll add is if you're betting on Allen Robinson, right, you're saying that a guy who had a career worst year, a really poor injury plague, inefficient year at age 28 is going to bounce back at age 29 uh, in a big way and be a wide receiver too. That's a tough bet for me to make, especially since last year. Keep this in mind. I don't know if people realize this. Only one receiver who opened the season age 29 or older finished top 25 in fantasy points or top 30 in receiving yards last season. So, and Robinson, of course, age 29. So, I don't know, there's a lot of things that have to go right for this to work out. I get it. I get this, the ceiling situation with being in this Rams offense, but there's enough for me there to knock him down to borderline wide receiver three as opposed to the wide receiver two conversation that he's jumped into. All right, so I want to I wanna dive into that just a little bit more here. What is your target share for Robinson in L.A.? Because that's interesting to me where we see the available opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have Van Jefferson significantly higher or Tyler Higby with nope. a significantly higher target share? What does that look like? Nope, uh, Higby's almost identical to last year at 14%. Same thing with Jefferson, also 14 which is exactly yep. where he was last year. Um, I have Robinson at 21 which uh, – you know, that's about where I'd want him anyway. I didn't really have to knock him down because of the situation here. They don't have a, a number three that you're super worried about. Now that could change, obviously, if they bring Odell Beckham back, but he probably right. won't play till midseason. Right. So I'm not really worried about that. But very low uh, target share for the running backs here, below average target share for the tight ends, and still about 21% for Robinson. Uh, maybe that's a little higher because I do have Tutu Atwell at seven. You know, you have Ben Skoranek, guys like that will get the occasional target. But right. um you know, that's, that's where I am on uh, Robinson 21. Okay. Yeah. I've got him at 22% and I've got him with 36 pass attempts per game. And that comes out to a pretty high number there for Robinson, as far as the target shares. So it uh, must just be the the difference there in overall pass attempts. Uh, that's, or you got Cooper cup, which is, you know, 35%, which I mean, it's hard to argue with that. 
Uh, uh, what's your what do you have for targets for Robinson? I have I've got him with I've got him with 135. Okay, yeah. Well, I will say this. I mean, when you you're there's no position harder to rank than than wide receiver. Not right. at, by far. I mean, once you get past eight or nine, it's like yep. okay, this guy could be tenth or he could be thirty fifth. You know, like that one range one of touchdown, one touchdown exactly. just yeah. sends him skyrocketing up. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking at points. I mean, I have Robinson at two oh seven. Yeah, twenty, and he's in the top twenty. Yeah, twenty points, yep. about one per game. He's in the top twenty. So you know, fair enough. If you're off by fifteen spots on a receiver, it's really not that big of a gap this year. Right. It's just a huge tier. A lot of movement this off season. A lot of first round rookies, you know, it's making wide receiver kind of uh, tough to sort through. For sure. All right. Talking about a wide receiver that is tough to sort through here to end the show. Let's talk about Rondale Moore in Arizona. We started the season with Rondale Moore last year, and it looked like we had just an incredible value in drafts. One of these guys who was absolutely just going to smash this year uh, through the first two weeks, and then it fell off a cliff. So you got Christian Kirk out of town. You've got DeAndre Hopkins suspended for the first six weeks of the season. Marquise Brown added, right? We just talked about where Marquise Brown left. He's now reunited with Kyler Murray in Arizona. So let's talk about Rondell Moore here very quickly. What are your expectations here for the second year wide receiver? Yeah, so at first in the offseason, I was uh, kind of optimistic about him breaking out based on uh, what the depth chart looked like in Arizona. And then, you know, you add in the Hopkins suspension and maybe it looks even better. But the fact is they still have mouths to feed here, right? They have, yep. uh, you know, Connor and Darrell Williams out of the backfield. You have Zach Ertz. They're going to utilize the tight end more. Obviously, Ertz was heavily targeted last year. And you don't draft Trey McBride in the second round to be a complete right. zero. Uh, Hollywood Brown's there. A.J. Green is back. And, you know, you would expect him to have a similar target share to last year. And then, of course, more. So, uh, you know, I, I just don't know if he has a path to a full on breakout and a lot more utilization downfield because, you know, last year he was a short range gadget guy. Right. Fifty one percent. Fifty one percent of his targets were screen passes. A quarter of his touches were carries. He had the lowest average depth of target in the NFL. I just don't know if that's going to change. They have other guys that can be used in the intermediate and deep range. So that's going to severely limit his fantasy output. Uh, I'm not quite as hopeful as, as I would have been. It's just not the, the situation I was kind of hoping for. Yeah. If we see those snaps increase, I think there's a possibility for Rondale Moore to break out and be a reliable fantasy wide receiver. But yeah, there's still a lot of mouths here to feed. Even AJ Green coming back and everyone's like, it's AJ Green. Well, he's still going to be involved in this offense, right? He's still mm -hmm. going to see target Zach Ertz over the middle of the field for sure. All right, Mike, thank you so much for taking some time out to jump onto the podcast here. Why don't you let everyone know what you got going on over at ESPN, where they can find and follow you if they don't already. Yeah, Mike Clay NFL on Twitter. It's where I usually keep everybody updated. I'll be, you know, doing the fantasy focus pod content going up at ESPN.com at the big uh, uh, season long playbook piece is coming out here pretty soon. So, uh, you know, keep them busy drafting, updating everything. So uh, it's been it's been a fun off season and uh, we'll keep at it. Absolutely. All right. Remember to go to the ffplaybook.com slash fan tracks giveaway to get entered into that signed DK Metcalf Seattle Seahawks jersey. Again, the ffplaybook.com slash fan tracks giveaway. All right. That'll do it for Mike Clay. I'm Kyle Yates, and we'll see you next time.